The Ukraine war has seen some major developments with the fall of the city of Avdivka to Russian forces. What are the implications of this battle? The death toll from Israel's brutal and genocidal war on Gaza has crossed 29,000. Israel insists that it will attack Rafah. There are increasing reports of the toll on health workers in the besieged territory. What are the health risks faced by Gazans? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before we go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. Russian forces have captured the town of Avdivka after Ukrainian forces withdrew. This is a major development as the battle for the town was the centre of a huge conflict for many months. As the war is set to complete two years, the defeat means further complications for Ukraine and President Zelensky, who are struggling to mobilise support from their allies. We go to Abdul for the latest on the war. Abdul, the fall of a very important town in Ukraine after, the very, after a very long, a very bloody battle and this comes as the second anniversary of the war is approaching. So, uh, what is the significance of uh, this development? Also, the past few days, past few weeks rather, there's a new commander-in-chief of Ukraine. So, how do you see all these developments? Well, Prashant, the fall of Avdivika, which uh, is a major town near uh, Donetsk, uh, uh, basically signifies a kind of new phase of war, uh, which basically breaks the stagnant phase which was there since the fall of Bakhmut and the so-called uh, Ukrainian counteroffensive, uh, which was launched uh, at the time, it, uh, which largely failed. And uh, the f fall of this particular city of Divika also shows that uh, the Ukrainian forces at this moment are struggling uh, to kind of uh, get enough ammunition, get enough uh, uh, forces and uh, sorry, uh, weapons and support to basically continue their war against the Russians. And that is, brings us to the larger picture primarily, which is that the support which Ukraine was getting all these uh, months, uh, in fact, the first year of the war, is basically has gradually declined uh, in the last few months. Uh, and in fact, the US, which was the uh, most important donor for Ukrainians uh, for a very long time, is struggling at this moment both because there is an election coming and because the Republicans have basically taken a very strong stand uh, that any uh, support to Ukraine is a waste of uh, U.S. taxpayers' money and we need, uh, by, uh, they basically are talking in a different language altogether. So at this moment, because there is not enough support coming from uh, the U.S. and also the European countries, which were already... Uh, which are already struggling to basically continue their support because of the economic reasons. There are some countries who have now signed bilateral agreements with Ukrainians to provide uh, weapons and other uh, ammunition, for example, France and Germany. Even they are not able to keep up their promises because of their own economic problems. And that has basically, uh, that is basically reflected in what is happening now uh, on the war front. And it seems that if the uh, status quo continues, in terms of support of the external for, uh, from the uh, European and uh, from the US, uh, Ukrainians will uh, lose more territory. Uh, and that basically is the uh, moment at this uh, uh, stage of the war, which is basically nearing its second uh, anniversary. And uh, it seems that it will continue further uh, because uh, there are no uh, concrete steps take, taken as if now to basically resolve the conflict. Uh, in any way. Yeah, but that is my question that, you know, early on in, very, in the first months of the war, there was a proposal for talks which was uh, famously se seems to have been shot down after the intervention of Boris Johnson and other Western leaders. But two years into the conflict, do we see the possibility of negotiations, you know, kind of picking up? Is there an opening over here? We know that elections are happening, so that might be a bar for many of these conversations to take place, elections in the US and Russia for that matter. But maybe after that, do we see the possibility of, say, some kind of negotiations taking place? See, if you uh, read the statements given by both Zelensky in Ukraine and the uh, uh, Western backers of Zelensky's uh, government in Ukraine or Zelensky's war in Ukraine, uh, both of them have, uh, their statements do not uh, give any confidence that they are even now ready to start any concrete steps towards peace 
um, uh, the, the kind of proposals which have come so far. For example, on Sunday, uh, while speaking during the Munich conference, security conference, uh, Zelensky has reiterated its position, uh, uh, which basically has he has continued to say, repeat in, in different ways since, uh, uh, you can say, December 2022, big, primarily saying that Russia has to withdraw completely uh, from all the territories, and in fact, not only withdraw, basically agree uh, should agree to kind of pay war enumerations and uh, should face the uh, tri uh, trial uh, for humanitarian violations and so on and so forth. The conditions which Russians have rejected again repeatedly and said that this kind of conditions do not uh, bring any confidence that Ukrainians are ready for peace. So if you see, since there is no change in this public stance taken by the Ukrainians or its best backers, they continue to talk about how Russians are enemies. To, for example, Europeans uh, during the conference, many conference have a uh, large num set of leaders said that Russians do not want any peace. They uh, see Europeans as enemy. So this kind of statements coming and uh, uh, and uh, their refusal to acknowledge the the situation on the ground. Uh, acknowledge that what happened, as you rightly pointed out, during the first few months of the war, when there was positive discussions, basically a kind of political bargain, which would have ended the war sooner. So if such steps are not uh, uh, reconsidered, uh, of course, there is no possibility of any peace uh, in the near future, because Russians are not going to accept uh, 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 that they are at fault completely and hence they have to unilaterally withdraw and face the trial and so on and so forth. It, that is unrealistic to assume at the first uh, place. So if, uh, and, and, and that's exactly the point that there is no proposal, concrete proposal for peace at this moment. And that basically leads to the conclusion that there is, uh, uh, the war may continue uh, for longer period, even after uh, uh, the elections in the US and in other parts of the world as well. Well, Abdul, thank you so much for that update. A very disturbing and depressing situation it does seem uh, at the end of two years. The death toll from Israel's genocidal war on Gaza has crossed 29,000, which concerns mounting over the proposed attack on Rafah. Meanwhile, more reports are trickling in of Israel's brutal treatment of health workers. These atrocities, along with the relentless attack on health infrastructure in Gaza, means that the health risks faced by Palestinians continue to rise. We go to Anna to find out more. Anna, thank you so much for joining us. Very disturbing accounts uh, from the field as far as the condition of health workers, what they're going through. Uh, activists have been chronicling them. Can you give us a sense of what some of these uh, updates are, what some of these testimonies are? Well, of course, for the last couple of days, uh, most of the news has been related to the attacks on Nasser Hospital, uh, which we have seen after a prolonged siege. So, uh, and just a quick recap on that. What we have seen is that after three or more weeks of besieging the hospitals of Alamal, uh, of Nasser, the Israeli occupying forces moved in. They hurt a lot of people uh, in, in the process. Uh, they they uh, destroyed equipment. Uh, health workers reported that everything from CT scans uh, to um, to other radi radiology equipment was was damaged in the process. Um, in Nasser, what was of course most disturbing is that both the health workers and the patients uh, staying inside were attacked directly. They were targeted over the course of the days. Uh, of course, we have also seen something that, uh, that, that that's quite uh, quite extraordinary uh, in uh, when the Israeli occupying forces sent a patient who had previously been kidnapped from the hospital to ask people to move out and then shot him as he was walking back to them. Uh, now, uh, the, the news over the last couple of days have also reported that several dozens of health workers from Nasser, uh, some reports say, say even 70 of them, had been kidnapped uh, by the Israelis during this process. Now, this, uh, this is disturbing in, in many, many ways, uh, mostly because we have seen that the Israeli army is now releasing the health workers whom they had taken before. Uh, from the hospitals in the north, uh, and they're all showing uh, extreme signs of extreme torture. They have, uh, they are showing signs of uh, of uh, going through extreme duress while they were imprisoned and while while they were disappeared, essentially. 
some of them uh, were taken from Al Shifa Hospital, which is one of the, uh, which is the biggest hospital and which we remember as one of the uh, of the earlier rates uh, and uh, targets uh, being being a target of the IOF. And so uh, these workers are reporting that they had been kidnapped while they were trying to move with their families down south. Uh, they they had been singled out. Uh, most likely because they were health workers, again, as we talked here, because they are particular targets of the IOF. Then afterwards, they had been taken to camps, uh, stripped of their clothes. They had been uh, kept in 10, ten camps uh, with uh, hundreds of other people. And then, of course, uh, forced to sit uh, throughout the day on their knees uh, for, uh, for, for hours and hours on end. There was nothing, as they report, there was nothing a sense provided to them, which uh, which would consist of essential meal of essential supplies, including hygiene, uh, or even uh, you know uh, being allowed to go to the bathroom. So uh, those are the things that uh, people are now expecting to happen to those who had been taken from the central uh, central areas, uh, and uh, also to those, of course, who people are anticipating will be taken from the hospitals in the south uh, as the Israeli army moves, moves in on there. Right, and of course, now the, one of the key, and another key question, of course, is the impact of all these kind of attacks, especially when it comes to communicable diseases, uh, the health condition of Palestinians. So what do the reports say as of there? Well, those reports also remain, of course, uh, you know, uh, worrying in, in many ways, again, because uh, we do know that uh, reporting uh, specific numbers is very, very difficult from the ground right now because there are no supplies to essentially track them. Uh, what we are hearing from UN sources is that uh, the communicable diseases are spreading. Uh, UN RWEA is very worried about uh, the, the cases of diarrhea, about uh, outbreaks of hepatitis A uh, in Rafa. Uh, and these are these again are of course you know uh, diseases that in normal circumstances they can be addressed. In circumstances like the ones in Rafa, it's not possible to do to, to do that to do that. Uh, and because as a result of that, uh, the UN has also warned that uh, a lot of children are dying uh, because of diseases that uh, can be stopped. And now what's also adding to the worries that uh, that are being reported as the offensive moves on, uh, down south is that essentially one of the hospitals in Rafa uh, is a maternity hospital. This hospital has been, uh, again, uh, singled out by several international organizations, including Doctors Without Borders, including Medical Aid for Palestinians, because it's a key, uh, key institution at moments like these. Uh, and so what the doctors from, from that hospitals are reporting is that essentially they are sending children, newborns, uh, in tents, uh, in, in living conditions, which, which are almost certain to cause their death because it's very cold. Uh, there, there is no food. There is no food for the mothers. So the, uh, so the mothers uh, are having uh, extreme difficulties breastfeeding. So uh, essentially it's just creating a situation where not only will communicable diseases like uh, respir respiratory diseases spread very easily, but the effects of the famine and the effects of the hunger uh, will increase the effects of that and make it just more horroring to, to live through. And Anna, thank you so much for that update. Uh, we'll come back to you over the days as more information comes in. Thank you so much. That's all we have in today's Daily Debrief. We'll be back with a fresh episode tomorrow. In the meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button.